Okay, um, good afternoon and good evening, distinguished ladies and gentlemen. I just want to confirm that my voice is audible. Yes, As, you are. Okay, great. So thank you so much uh, for joining us today. Great. Okay, so thank you so much, distinguished ladies and gentlemen. It's quite a moment and a great privilege from Tequila Capital for us to have a conversation on building category king companies within the African space. My name is NDBC. Okay, okay, I'm the lead faculty, I'm the chairman of the Kidia Capital. So um, the topic of our conversation today is the Africa's unicorn farms. Essentially, we'll be looking at a construct, how we are seeing an amalgam of technology enabled companies being created and being bred across many African seeds. So as we go to that, I begin by just explaining what a unicorn is all about. A unicorn is essentially a technology enabled startup that is worth at least a billion dollars. I have used this analogy that it is a special type of an animal. And in Africa, we have many farms that are producing uh, these uh, special breeds of animals, just like we have farms that are breeding cows, goats, and other things. So what is happening today is that there is a construct of Cambrian entrepreneurial capitalism, where digital technologies are enabling a new audience, a market system that has made it possible that we can have these companies that are worth at least a billion dollars coming. We don't have a lot of them, but if you look at the trajectory, one thing is evident that the future is one that we are going to have so many of them. So what are going to be the implications and what are going to be the opportunities also? How are they going to change the ordinance of the economic architectures in Africa? So I hope that within the next few minutes, we'll have a conversation to see how we can play a role, how we can participate, and possibly how we can adjust even the way we live and things we do because this change is just right on the way. The first thing for us is there are challenges and there are opportunities in nations. You know, just using the Economist magazine, you can see a very clear trajectory, what is it's all about. Just in two, year 2000, economists say that the African economy was hopeless. And then a few years later, they said that Africa is arising. And then later, they also say that there is an aspiring Africa that you are largely looking from the position where it was to the position where he wants to attain. And now the latest one is the new scramble for Africa. That new scramble for Africa is basically a new dimension where investors, entrepreneurs, market players, and market movers are seeing Africa as an opportunity space where they can come to participate in the whole constructs of business systems. So you see investors coming from United States, you see uh, people coming from China, you see people coming from all over the world. And people are coming into the continent, which of course we know that Africa has so many opportunities. Because how do you know the opportunities of nations are actually within the challenges of nations. The opportunities of continents are also within the nations of the challenges of the continents. So we have many, many frictions. Frictions are the problems that customers have. Frictions are the challenges that market systems have. Frictions are the perturbations that companies experience. We don't have good electricity supply. We're still struggling with clean water. We're still having issues with our roads. There are just so many things that you can think about. But if you see these things from the pessimistic model, you can just say, hey, there is nothing I can do. But interestingly, we are seeing a new generation of entrepreneurs who are now going right to solve those problems 
And by going to solve those problems, they are now rebuilding nations, rebuilding economies. So I've said that great entrepreneurs build nations and continents. And we are at the moment seeing a very great amount of these gentlemen and ladies within the African space. So a hopeless continent is now the one where people find massive level of opportunities. So why is that so? What is happening here is we are now a farmland. And in that farmland, we are breeding a new type of animal. And that animal, of course, you will not see it in your agricultural science, elementary school or secondary school. They call it the unicorns. Unicorns are special types of breeds of animals. You don't see them often. But when you see them, they are remarkable. And those unicorns are companies that are worth at least a billion dollars. Very key to understand that a billion dollars within the African space is a lot of money. It's a very, very huge valuation because most of our economies are still largely small. So there are some of these animals that we have seen already out of the farm land of Africa. You see Flora Wave, Ope, the wave, Interswitch, and Dela cheaper cash, Conga. Just recently, they added Conga because the Forbes News mm. estimates said that it's worth at least a billion dollars now. And within, at the level of labor, at the phase of labor, that means these animals have not been born to become unicorns, but they are the pipeline of being born to become unicorns. You see the Kudu Bank, Twiga Foods, Butterfly, there's so many of them. These are companies that have not been reported to be at least worth a billion dollars. But we know that in the next possibly 18 months, most of them will transition into that $1 billion valuation. So I estimate that by the end of 2023, we are going to have at least 15 unicorns within the African continent. And when we use the word Africa here, it's also key to understand that most of these companies are not necessarily African. What we are focusing here is that most of them are operating majorly within the African continent. That is a discussion for another day because what is going on here is most of them are incorporated outside Africa, but of course, 80 something of more than 90% of their business operations take place in, in the continent. And these special breeds of animals are ramping up around the world. And, and in just in 2021, uh, we have tons of them all over the world. It's something that we have to look at. Because what is going on is that our economic systems are being redesigned. Economic systems are being transformed and new dimensions of opportunities are being created. And why are those things happening? It's all about market systems. There is an opportunity and there is, someone has to go for those opportunities. The demand needs something. The supplier has something to offer. And you create companies to fix the friction that exists between the demand and supply. And great companies that can do that job very well, they are now highly rewarded because they have the capabilities that are better than other companies that are also trying to do the same. This has been the fundamental element that has existed for centuries and through even the time of Adam Smith. The relationship between demand and supply and the necessity of the formation of farms. But there is, has never been something in the African continent that has brought a new dimension to that relationship. So for us at the Kiria Capital, we see where this change is coming from. And that change is coming because of a great convergence. Pythagoras postulated many centuries ago that everything in the world is nothing but numbers. That if you are in the business of agriculture, that you are only manipulating numbers related to agriculture. That if you are in the business of trading, that is nothing but numbers around trading. And according to Pythagoras, 
in his postulation, he said that if you understand the numbers around whatever you do, that you have a better possibility of understanding the construct within that particular thing you're doing. So whether you are a banker, whether you are a doctor, whether you are an engineer, at the end of all, you are looking at the numbers to help you make better decisions about what you are doing. And that is a very, very important thing because we have always lived with that construct. But the problem has always been that we don't have the capacity to build, mine, aggregate, and make sense of numbers so that we can use that knowledge system to go and fix frictions which are evident in markets. The frictions are the problems that customers have with payments, the problem customers have with logistics, the problem customers have with supply chain. So the tools just over the last few years now became a little bit available. We have the software tools through the mobile internet making it possible that a young man in a garage in Kenya can now build an app, have an API, and that software tool can help him or him to gather data. And he looks at that data, he understands that data, and he sees a pattern. And when he sees that pattern, he said, this is something that is working. But remember when he did not have the capacity to understand the numbers around what he was trying to do, he would not even know what was going on. What was happening here is that by having this access to number and making sense of the number, we remove guesswork in our decision making. And as that was happening also, the property rights have been deepened. Unfortunately, that property rights is not necessarily within the African space. You have just started a business in Lagos and you have an investor from Silicon Valley who wants to invest in you. The person may say, okay, you have to go back and recuperate that business in Delaware, United States, because they want to make sure that they don't have surprises where magically that company is distorted somewhere, maybe in the government database. In the past, that system was not evident because registering that company in the United States was exceedingly very difficult. But today, you stay in Lagos, you do that. And by doing that, the investor says, oh, this company is now American. They have a strong intellectual property rotation. And on the basis of that, I will give you a million dollars to go and continue building that business in Lagos. And because of that one B million, you have resources now to go and do whatever you're trying to do. So we see that the availability of affordable tools to make it possible for young people to build, to organize and recognize factors of production in order to fix frictions in markets, and the possibility that they can also domicile their companies where investors feel confident that their rights are protected. And now building and bringing all these things together under numbers is actually the reason why we are having the, the Cambrian moments that we are having at the moment. So at those tools, you see computational systems, you see mobile internet, you see companies like Amazon, Google Cloud, AWS from Amazon helping us to make it possible that you don't need to raise tons of money before you start because everything is happening at the dimension of, of, of mobile uh, cloud. So by democratizing the production systems, opportunities have opened up a scale that has never happened. And what has happened here has become evident that Africa is now moving from an invention society to an innovation society. An invention society is a society where there are so many ideas. Everyone has an answer to a problem, but no one gives you a solution to that problem. You walk into a motor park, people tell you, hey, we have answers how to provide good education in Adia State, Nigeria. And you walk into a, a beer parlor in Abuja, somebody tells you, I know how to provide 24 seven electricity in the city of Abuja. But give the same group of people one month, two, three months, nothing happens because they are living in inventive society 
where more ideas are there instead of products and the services. But what is going on here, because of the three elements we look at, Africa at the time is transitioning from being an invention society to an innovation society. Innovation society is now a society where people go and do products and services, and those products and services are now used to overcome challenges and frictions that customers have in the market. It's not a question of being smarter. It's not a question of being more intelligent. It's a question of having the capacity to recombine and combine factors of production in order to overcome frictions that customers have by building products and services that they need. And in this plot here, I show you a redesign looking at the GDP of the United States and China over the last 2,000 years. About just before 500 years ago today, you look at these GDPs of these two countries, they are flat, flat in GDP. In other words, people that live generations apart were poor, right? Because the people that lived here were poorer than people that lived here. And people that lived here were poorer than people that lived here because population was increasing even when the GDP was not increasing. In other words, the per capita income were decelerating from one generation to another, meaning that people were getting poorer over time. That was what an invention society would give you. But there were so many smart people that lived there. The, the concept of physics, chemistry, and biology, some of the most fundamental elements in mathematics, people that lived here helped us to create them. They invented compounds but they could not make vaccines. And when polio came, they died. Tuberculosis came, they died. But they were very brilliant people, but they could not make products and services. But something changed that right here, instead of this GDP continually being linear, it started going up. We are now in that first phase of innovation society. But interestingly, and also unfortunately, it's not every part of the world that experiences this moment of exponential GDP. You have places like United States and Western Europe, they're experiencing this growth, but unfortunately, Africa did not capture. That's why we have not seen that significant bump in our GDP. And in this growth, there are two phases, the wave one of innovation society and the wave two of innovation society. The wave two is when we are now looking at AI, autonomous systems, which we believe will be taking off very soon, changing even the trajectory that the world is in. So how do we now see that redesign? What we are seeing here is a group of innovators in Africa are now moving us from that invention society of people talking about how to provide better payment system to actually building solutions, solving problems, that market systems have. Because nations do not just change by people postulating theories. Nations change but when people go out and make great things happen. And that is where that Cambrian moment of a new society that we are all want to see will begin to emerge. And I just explained this call for you to see what is going on here. And what happened here is that at 1790, the patent system or the property rights in the United States was formulated. Many parts of the world copied it. And when they coupled it, great things happened. And there is a very big, important mark maker there because if they have not formulated that intellectual property and property rights, there is no way transfer of value, translating those ideas into products and services would have happened. I give a very great example. What is the incentive for somebody to give you a million dollars to go and create a drug. If after you have created that drug, another person can copy it and also replicate it. So the Americans felt that there had to be an element of exclusivity that make it possible that that person that was risking his capital will be given a, a period of time to recover that investment before other people can participate in that particular endeavor. So they brought out the patent system 
and that will show a tremendous impact in their economic system. And other nations have also adopted a strong intellectual redesign. They've also seen an amazing thing. So what we have seen also from our data is that the moment came for most African startups when the investors now felt more confident that even though they could operate in Africa, if they are domiciled in places with stronger property rights, that they can take risk on them more than if they leave them in the continent. This is a very, very unfortunate thing for even some of us in the Africa that Africans should be saying, because what is going on here is they are not likely to give you $10 million if you are not open to move that company from Lagos to, to Delaware or to United States or London. They are not likely to give you $50 million if that company remains a Nairobi, a Kenyan company, because they feel that the, the, the property rights that will help them to protect that investment that you may not have the ordinance within your legal system to give them that necessary structure. And internet made it possible because with internet, there is more visibility and transparency, information asymmetry disappeared to a large extent, and they can now restructure that company, move it outside Africa, unfortunately, and just like that, they now release that capital. By releasing the capital, we can now have the tools to now build within the factors of production. We have always had the knowledge. Africa has always had the knowledge. Africans have always had those with entrepreneurial mindset. But the challenge has always been those that will take risk on them. And if you cannot get those that will take risk on them, bad things will continue to happen. So now the knowledge came converged with risk takers and a pool of capital or found a way for it to now enter into the space so that young people can now raise tons of millions. We are seeing them every day in the farmland of Africa's uh, hubs and, and they now started doing great things. So what is going here on now, you see the people, you see the tools, you see the processes, all of them converging and they are doing something that is unprecedented. What do I mean by being unprecedented? If you look at the data, it's extremely amazing. A bank in Nigeria called Wema Bank was started in 1947. I think as of 2010, it has not hit up to, I mean, 1 million customers thereabout. But you see a small startup called Kuda which was started and within less than three years, it hit the same milestone. You look at a company like Flora Wave Nigeria, which have 900,000 merchant customers. I'm not even sure how many banks in Nigeria, big banks in Nigeria that can boast of having that, that kind of massive number. So what is happening here is that capital has unlocked new species of animals called unicorns, and some of them are born. Some of them, there is still that labor period. Some of them are being seeded and they are coming to change the whole thing that we know about the beautiful continent. Knowledge will remain very critical because without knowledge, nothing happens. And if you can go through human history, when you have ability to create knowledge, beautiful things happen. But interestingly, internet has also made it possible that the knowledge you don't have you can go on the web and capture and get that knowledge. So we have seen that the web has brought a unification of those critical elements of factor to production that we used to struggle with, that if there is something I don't understand, I can go online and read it, study it. And when those things come, beautiful things begin to happen. And as that is happening, we are going to see a massive level of transformation in the economy. We're going to see, I'm using the United States as a case study here. If you look at it, about one, about 1917, uh, the largest company, United States, we are construction com company like steel companies, uh, like, like US Steel. And then 50 years later, the largest companies are like infrastructure companies like IBM, AT&T, like equivalent of their MTN and Globe. Now, today, their largest companies are 
knowledge-based companies like Apple, Alphabet, which is Google, and Microsoft and Co. So you could see that there is a clear level of transformation as a result of these new changes in the economic systems of nations for moving from mainly construction anchored powerful empires to ones that are mainly infrastructure based at the technology layer now to the ones that are now driven of the power of knowledge you could see changes in economy and if you look at africa you can also see some level of similarities level of similarities here is that the largest companies in africa using nigeria as a case study they are food companies they are construction comp uh, uh, building companies there are also uh, infrastructure companies like MTN and uh, Airtel. Then you see food. We are still dealing with how to eat, how to how to, how to make sure we have food on the table, and we also have the consortium uh, supporting companies like Dankote Cement and Dankote. You have Bua Foods here, which is also one of the companies that is worth at least a trillion naira in the Nigerian stock exchange. In the U.S., you have these are their largest companies. Many of them are largely knowledge-based companies. Like I have also noted. I have never seen Tesla as a car company because the business model of Tesla, the largest state, seems to be software driven. You, 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 you buy a car, when you resell that car, you, you never transfer the software license you have for Tesla to another car. And if you have a Tesla, you need to keep paying subscription fees for certain things. Just imagine if that Toyota car you have in your house in Lagos, if you have to be sending money to Toyota, even as we are driving that car. That is the same thing with Tesla. Whenever you have it, you don't even own the whole rights of even reselling the car without the new buyer going to acquire licenses for the software directly from Tesla. And that is the reason when you are valuing Tesla as a company, the multiples in Tesla cannot be correlated or compared with Mercedes, Toyota, and Honda, because the model, the business systems upon which Tesla run is totally orthogonal to what every other car company does. And that's why that knowledge, that business model is what, what has made it very, very unique. So we, we continue that and we can see that the wave two is coming on board. Remember here in this map here, I shared here with you that we are in wave one. The wave two is coming. The wave AI autonomous system and so many beautiful things happen. The good news for us in Africa is that we are actually building capacity, not just to become, let me say consumers, but also become creators and, and create and, and producers. So in the nineties, we experienced the new generation banking era where a group of innovators across Africa banking system went out to bring a new system in banking by creating what they call integrated banking system. You have a bank account in one branch of a bank. In that country, you can operate it from any other branch because the general ledger of the bank has been a kind of distributed and then centralized, meaning that you don't have to go to the specific branch to get money, provided you can have access to any branch of the same bank. That changed the banking industry. And some of the banks that were created during that era they are some of the most dominant banking institutions across most African markets. If you go to Nigeria today, the largest bank by market cap is Zenit Bank. They come to GT Bank. These were all created in the 1990s. Then in 2000s, we had the voice telephony when MTN, Glow, Airtel, whatever it was called that time, all of them came. They made it possible that we could communicate. We could talk. That was their era. Now in 2010s, we were in the mobile internet era. That is the moment that we now saw ability to use our phone, to communicate, to talk, to chat, to do WhatsApp and do all kinds of things. At this time in 2020s, I've called it the application utility era. The application utility era is no more just chatting, talking on Facebook, it's now, using the capacities and the capabilities of mobile internet, applying them to different sectors in our economies to fix frictions which are evident in the market. So you have the mobile internet becoming catalytic to new ordinance 
that we can play across the industrial sector. So you go to energy sector, you see companies like Ucopa, which doesn't even see itself as a, a solar company, but now as a financial services company, making it possible for people to buy an energy and, and do things. You go into agriculture, you see how data systems are making it possible that farmers are actually improving the agriculture. You go to education and see how software systems are improving to distribute content to mobile devices so that kids can learn irrespective of their location. So every industry, every sector is now being totally redesigned in this application utility era where these mobile internet constructs are being applied one by one. And those who are applying these constructs are changing the continent. And those who are doing these things are capturing massive level of value. They are changing the healthcare sector. They are changing the financial services sector. They are going to do to a large extent what the new generation bank did to the old banks. They are going to do that to the economic system. The largest financial institution in Nigeria today is Flora Wave. It's a company that is not even up to, it's about five years old. How can you say a company that is not even up to six years becoming bigger than First Bank Nigeria, which has existed for more than a century? What is going on here is that Flora Wave now tapped into that application utility era and it is changing everything that we understand in markets. So there are so many fundamental things which are making this thing possible. They are building services with a higher level of customer centricity. They are using demand to control how they are delivering products and services to the market. And they're also using one of the most potent business models of the 21st century, which is the aggregation constructs. And as they are doing that, they are engineering a marginal cost improvement that cannot even diminish or deteriorate even at infinity. In the old world, looking at the business of cement, food, delivery, if you improve scale, at a time, you hit a diminishing return. What they call unit economies or marginal costs specifically will begin to deteriorate. They tell you, hey, you are growing too fast. Please reduce the number of branches because your marginal cost has deteriorated. But with all these new generation of companies which are natively digital, they don't have that marginal cost inefficiency. In other words, even as they continue to grow, asymptotically, using mathematical language here, they do not see inefficiencies in their marginal cost, meaning that the curve tends toward, as it tends towards infinity, it gets towards near zero. That means they keep improving and they keep improving. And that is the reason why they can scale faster than anything that you have imagined in history. And as a result, that from one branch, from one office, CUDA can serve anybody in Nigeria. And today, you can combine this valuation, have more than nine banks, their market valuation cannot be up to what it has. We see that Florida Wave at three, B, 3 billion is bigger than most banks in Nigeria combined. So what we are saying here is these companies are exploiting a better marginal cost efficiency that is largely unprecedented because they have built their businesses natively on the digital internet. And by building it on that digital model internet, they have opened a dimension that no old institution can match. Opportunities are there in healthcare, fintech, and this is just, I would say, at the beginning. And as things are happening, I want to tell you that it's happening in a major farmland. That farmland is the African farmland. It's growing these animals called the unicorns, and it's just bringing them up, Lagos, the Wave is a Francophone African company. It's based somewhere in one of the Francophone African speaking countries, French speaking countries. So you are not just saying that this is only here in English Anglophone parts. You are having this moment across different clusters. If you go to North Africa, they're also creating all kinds of great companies there. 
go to East Africa, they are building, then go to Southern Africa, go to West Africa, you go to, what is going on is, it's a continent under transformation. Of course, unfortunately, some of the wealth, even though they'll be created here, they will not be owned here. That is a conversation for another day. But one thing we know is that the unicorns are being born. And most of them will be born, more of them will be born this year, possibly than those that we already have. So the question here is how can we participate as a people? And that was the reason why we started the Kidia Capital. And that the Kidia Capital will basically say, hey, we wanna make it possible that if we can make, bring young people together to build great products, bring superior execution, the propensity that they can create great companies will be there. We also believe in the supremacy of business model. And when people build great business models, architects great business model that they can win in markets. And we say, hey, if you have $1,000, if you have $10,000, you can invest with us. And then we have taken positions in some of the finest companies in the continent. And we are starting the next edition uh, in the next, just next week, at uh, the next investment cycle. And we're looking for people that are interested to go invest with us. Basically what we do here is that we have about six, seven companies. Uh, we, 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 we take time to understand them. They come into our, our, our ecosystem. They pitch to our members, our members invest in them. And uh, when they invest in them, they go back to continue to, to, to build those, those entities. And to a large extent, we have done remarkably very, very well. We've sent companies to Y Combinators. We've sent companies to tech startups, And that means these are companies that have done remarkably well, that they have also raised further capital across the global space. So that's what we do in Tequila Capital. And we use a very clear understanding of entrepreneurial capitalism in a very optimistic way that everything that is happening today is still at the level of infancy. In other words, nothing has really happened because the future is still full of abundance in the farmland. The farmland must create more unicorns because we need to breed more in order to solve and fix the frictions which continue to be over the land. So thank you so much, gentlemen. That's just what the short presentation then we can now go into the question and answer. If you have a question, please raise your hand and let's begin. I want to take some questions and then we'll be out of here. Thank you so much for attending our session. So Elizabeth, go ahead and answer a question. Thank you. All right, dear. Well done, Prof. You do, you're doing so well. So now, if I make an investment of um, 430000 can you explain to me in layman's language the rate of return I'm going to get back and how it's going to work? Thank you. Rate of return I'm going to get back. Uh, uh, no, actually, uh, that 430,000 is not actually the investment. That's actually just for you to become a member of a syndicate. So see that as a kind of a membership fee or for investment cycles or our annual fee. So that's the four. So if you now want to make an investment, the minimum amount you can invest is $10,000 so equivalent. So you now decide on the company's invest. Interestingly, this is a very, very risky investment because these are extremely young companies. These are not like publicly traded companies. We've never had any problem of any, but we also tell people that investing in startup is extremely very risky. And we do a lot of due diligence. We, we spend a lot of time with founders to make sure that companies are coming to our cycle. They are companies that we have confidence they will thrive. But there is nobody that will tell you what your return will be because there is no way to model what your return will be. But one thing we know is that uh, we had a startup we, that came to us last May. We invest, it came at a valuation of $1.2 million. And that startup raised money at $35 million uh, last, last month. So we have another that came at valuation of $7.5 million and he raised money at a valuation of $110 million this year. So in other words, if you have invested when that startup came, there is a $10,000. After all dilutions, uh, there is the possibility that when he was raising money at that close to that $50 million, you would have, uh, for that $10,000 within a year, would have given you 
up to 300,000 at, at the multiple of 10. So if it works, there is nothing in the world that compares to it. But the problem is that the money can also disappear if that startup collapses. But there is one hypothesis that we use a lot in, in, in Tekidia Institute. Our hypothesis here is really on, the co on this belief that the only reason and the only way that a startup will fail is if that startup doesn't do what it said it would do. Because the problems are still there. We have not solved our educational problem. We have not solved our, 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 our healthcare problem. So if a startup is doing that and that startup does not deliver, it means that that startup fell. But we don't see a scenario where if that startup actually has the capacity to do what it said to do, there is no way that that startup is gonna struggle. So that's why besides the idea, we take time to look at people we work with. We take time to understand what drives them. We take time in understanding the human element because for us, that is actually one of the most catalytic element factor in, in winning this market. So I, I hope I've uh, explained this a little bit, but let me be very clear here. This is not something that somebody can just waggle into. You need to make sure that you can take risk because it's actually very, very risky. It is very, very risky. It's very, very, uh, so just ha have that understanding. Yeah. Mm. Okay, let's go to Patrick, please. Patrick. Uh, Patrick, are you there? Yes, I'm here, Prof. Okay, you need to get too closer to your microphone. I, I don't think I can hear you very well. I hope I'm in, our community here also may not be hearing you well. Are you hearing me? Yes, you can hear, but speak closer to your microphone. Yes, I can hear you. Go ahead. Somebody is actually cutting in. Um, yeah, so you did in your illustration, you did mention that we are still at um, food and cement, majorly, right? And then um, some of these companies are coming in and raising these tons of money. But as our economy is still at that um, cement and food sector, what kind of what can, what can you really suggest? Would be a way to balance the equation of raising these funds, right? That will also um, make make some kind of um, allowance for some of these um, uh, cement and, and food company to come out more in scale, while those um, allowances so you probably made also for the for the el electronic companies to continue to, to increase their capacity. We have a double in that approach. Okay. Thank you. Okay, great. Yeah, so that, that's a very great question. Uh, it's understanding here largely that, of course, we have been able to merge the experience the U.S. has, the cement phase, which is the steel and infrastructure. But in Africa, using Nigeria, we have been able to merge both of them together. It means that, of course, we are coming after them. So our ability to move faster is certainly going to be higher because we are coming after they have built some critical systems. So the, there are people that are investing in this space. There are people that are investing in this space. Many private equity firms are in the business of investing in this space. But for us in Tequila Capital, unfortunately, unfortunately, we do not just have that, that understanding and that capacity. So that's why we are focusing on the knowledge part. So I am presenting it from my own angle. And of course, there are some conversations you have. You see people that they are not interested in these kind of knowledge firms in Africa. They are largely more concerned about how they can and, uh, invest in companies like this. So all you need to know here is go into such uh, domains and you will actually hear people uh, uh, talk about them. I know that, for instance, IBTC Bank in Nigeria has this infrastructure fund. They invest in roads, they invest in, in things like this. And I also know that there are some companies, they have telecommunication media fund, they invest in telecoms and things like that. But on our own, we are investing in early stage startup. And there is a reason for that. If somebody has $10,000 and puts it in a small startup at this phase in, in, a, in maybe in a FinTech or in an agriculture technology company, that $10,000 can turn out maybe $300,000. But when you come into this space, for you to even knock on the door, you need about a million dollars 
because of the scale of capital you need. So this one, everyone is priced out to a large extent. Or has at this phase of this application utility era, even five thousand dollars can get you a little space in the set. That that that's 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 the, that's the difference. So yeah, yeah. So let's uh, let's go to Chiju. Uh, Wenaya, uh, please go ahead. <laughs> Oh, thank you so much, Prof. Uh, you've been doing so wonderful a job in our own system here. Uh, my question, you've actually answered it to an extent, but I wanted to know if there is any way somebody with um, maybe $5,000 can get into the system. And probably if there's a way, maybe another tire that can be created so that instead of maybe $1,000 for registration, one can pay $500, uh, $500 and then maybe this probably uh, $5,000 is way bro. Okay, okay. Um, yeah, actually, <clears throat> yeah, I think, okay. Yeah, actually we have a, a scenario where a group of friends come together and sometimes they contribute 1,000 and 10 of them will have uh, 10,000. The reason why we do not want to make it like you can invest with uh, 1,000, we don't just want somebody to go and start selling his, uh, his sofa in the house or TV just to come and uh, do this. We want you to, to be like, this is money you can risk. <laughs> so by making it that this is money you can risk, I, I must be very honest with you, um, uh, you, we have to make it a little bit higher. Somebody who can afford a thousand dollars certainly can absorb a high level of risk. It's a very expensive club to join. Because a club that you need to pay $1,000 for a 30,000 Naira is expensive because I don't even know any club <laughs> that you need to pay that high much. It's not common in Nigeria. But that is also a way of weeding out a system where we don't allow people to take risks they cannot absorb. But what we have seen in many of our members, uh, we have many of them. These are colleagues at work. These are friends. They go out, play football. This person is okay. Five of us will we we'll come together. We always tell them, if there are five of you, we are not going to sign contract with one person. So go to the government, go to Aba, go to Onichango and uh, Zamfara, Kanu, Oshobo, register what we call a business name. That business name, five of you become owners of that business name. And then you will now sign that contract with Tequila Capital with that business name. Tequila Capital is a US company, I must note. And then we will see five of you through that business name. And that business name is owned by five of you. You all, you tell your families about it. That is an investment you are making into a startup through us. That becomes a family heritage. That becomes a family asset. But we will not go and say, let's take $200 from one person. No, we think that um, oh, that, that could be reducing the, the level of risk. Mm. So, so we want to still keep it away so that we have to make sure only those who can absorb this risk are those that can actually take it. Let's go to Paul or Ojo, please. Paul or Ojo, go ahead. Yeah. Paul, if you are there, please unmute yourself. Okay, if Paul is not there, let's go to Ikenna, please. Ikenna, go ahead. Hello, um, thank you very much, Prof, for the wonderful presentation. So um, I just have a question to ask regarding the, um, can you hear me? Yes, yes, very loud and okay. clear. Okay, I just wanted to ask a question regarding the incorporation of a company already existing in Nigeria um, in the US um, at the request of the potential investors. So if, for instance, a company um, has already been incorporated, say in Lagos, in Nigeria, and then um, some in investors are interested in um, taking up, um, in, put your, investing into the company, I request that the company is um, also becomes incorporated in the United States. So um, how is the structure um, most likely going to um, be set out? Like, would it be like the company in the US would be like a subsidiary of the company in Nigeria? Yeah, or yeah. It's, going to it's, be like it's a as simple as ABCD. Yeah, um, okay. you just incorporate the company in US, it becomes the uh, holding a company, and the one in Nigeria, the one in Africa, or the one in anywhere becomes a subsidiary of that. It's as simple as just like you have Microsoft United States, which is the main okay. Microsoft. The Microsoft Nigeria okay. is a subsidiary of Microsoft USA. Microsoft Kenya is owned by Microsoft USA. 
Microsoft, uh, Russia is owned by Microsoft USA. So the holding company, okay. yeah, moves to okay. US while every other one becomes uh, a subsidiary of that. Uh, that's what we okay. call double, okay. that's what they call a flip. You just flip it. Mm. Oh, oh, I see. Okay, okay, that makes sense now. Okay, yeah, thank you, you just very flip much. It. Mm, yes. So okay. it's, it's actually the simplest thing to do. Mm. So let's okay. go to okay. David Umo, please. And I want us to, in the next uh, a few minutes, to, to round up. Let's David Umo, please. Mm. <clears throat> okay, so uh, I just for the good presentation. So, so I have uh, four, just four things I need clarity on based on your presentation. Uh, first one is, uh, do, you, do you have preferences in terms of industry uh, that you, you actually invest in? Um, the, the second question is, uh, when does the second cycle, I think according to your presentation, you've said the second cycle is When okay. does it start? Um, okay. And the third question is, um, do you have, in, in terms of, because I'm, I'm sure it seems you had a first cycle, just to be very specific on the results you've had, is it okay to share with us some of the results you've had from your first cycle? And my final question is now, the $1,000 for the annual cycle, I, I see on the presentation you said the first cycle. What exactly does that mean? No, I didn't hear that last one, but the first one I would say here is that the next cycle is starting in, in just in a week time. So if you join us now, you participate in that. And uh, we are industry agnostic. We invest in any industry, but that industry must, that company must be powered by technology. So we invest in any industry, but it must be technology powered. So what was the last one I mixed it? Mm. The last question, the $1,000 annual fees for four cycles. So what, what is that for? Okay, cycle? yeah, so what happens here is that when you pay that annual fee, if for any reason that we cannot do four cycles in a year, it, 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 that means it, it extends more than 12 months until you, you get involved in, in four cycles. That's basically what it is. So, so if in a, in a year, either for one reason or the other, we, we, did, we do only uh, two cycles, it means even after 12 months, you are still fine. You don't have to pay another fee because you've not reached four cycles. That's what that's what that means. Okay, so so, so I can say you're saying it's one thousand dollars for every four cycle. That, that's what. It yes, means. That, that's basically what it means. Yes. Okay. Yes. Okay. Thank you. Yeah. Thank you. Okay, and and then on the startups that we have uh, invested in, and we invested in our past, invested in Mako. Actually, um, I can just. Uh, I don't know. Let me just share with you here. We invested in a couple of them and uh, make, yeah, if you just Google it and, you know, the way you measure this startup is, uh, have they been able to raise for that capital? Yes. And but that's that's the most important thing. You want to invest in startups that are good that other investors want to invest in them. Yes, they have been. Mm. So let, let's go to Godwin or Fodum, please. Godwin, go ahead. Mm. Thank you, Prof. Okay, Please, go ahead. I want, Thank to, you. I, want to, yeah, I want to find out, as you're saying that the next circle will start uh, in, in one week or thereabouts. Mm. So if, one, if one is not able to invest, for instance, if a group of people will not have to do a competition or something, they to be able to uh, invest as a company. So it, since it's not an individual. So if one does not make the circle, does it end at the end of March or how long is a circle? No, you, you can just do another. Uh, so the circle takes about three weeks. Once you open it up, you light the startup you light, you indicate interest, you transfer the money, that's it. Then uh, later on, we also have oh, new branches of now. companies. Yeah, you don't have to invest in now, every cycle. Mm. You don't have to invest in every cycle. Mm. You don't have to invest in every cycle. Mm. Okay. Okay, so let's go to um, Melvin, please. Melvin, mm -hmm. unmute yourself and ask a question. Thanks. Thank you, Prof. Can you hear me? Yes, yes. Mm. Yeah. Okay, Um. like you said earlier, that a group of people can come together to invest, right? So when the group of people comes together to invest, that means they'll come, they'll just pay that same $1,000 for as registration, as registration fee. 
Yes, yes. They all come together. We see what, them as one group or one, one entity. Yeah, yes. Mm -hmm. Okay. Right. Okay. So let's go to Gibbons, please. Uh, Gibbons. Mm -hmm. All right, Prof. Thank you very much for, I mean, for the presentation. So I have two questions. The, the first one is uh, on property rights that you mentioned. You know, as a catalyst you know, for innovation, right? So, what is the um, effect, okay, of um, property rights in Nigeria? All right, is it how easy it is to for a startup or for an innovator to protect his rights in Nigeria, and how is that helping innovators um, to come up more in Nigeria? That's the first question. Then the second question is, what was the process for a startup to apply for funds at um, Secadia Capital? Thank you. OK. OK, that, that second one, just go to our website, uh, capital.tekida.com. You will see that what we need in startups. Then you can reach out to us. And I think our email address is, uh, uh, let me just put it here, is capital at, is, uh, is, Capital at fastmicro.com. You can also send your pitch deck there. Sorry. Then the on the intellectual property or property rights. And I think a GT Bank is still in court with uh, innocent motors. <clears throat> I don't know whether it's getting to a decade now or one year or, or 11 or 12. I don't know. And if you check, you see that if you have a court case with the Supreme Courts in Nigeria, the earliest you can get appointment maybe next four years. No one wants to run a business in that kind of lousy legal system. Because most of these VCs, when they raise fund, they have to return the money back to the family offices or their limited partners within maybe six to 10 years. So if one court case can take 12 years, it means that the issue will not be resolved even before they need to return money to the people that gave them money to invest. The people you see that are investing this money are not the people that own the money. I think you know that. They are representing people that invested in them to invest in startups. So when you don't have a legal system that can deal with small issues quick and fast, instead of all this injunction, jurisdictional, is it in Abuja, is it in Potako, it happened, Nigeria just wastes so much time. There is no way somebody will give you $20 million in that company. So what do they do? They say, okay, incorporate that company in US, we give you that money as a US company. Then you can now, anytime you need that money, withdraw it from a US bank, use it in Nigeria. And if there is any problem in Nigeria, that problem is settled in a US court because you are not a Nigerian company. So that is where the property rights becomes key because it means that the legal system for that money that is being invested is streamlined that all the unnecessary waste, waste of time that we experience in our system will not affect whatever you're trying to do. And, and it's a very, very fundamental thing. Yeah, and it's, a, it's the most power. No nation in the world has advanced economically without fixing its property rights. The right to a piece of land, the right to your house, the right to your car, the right to anything, either IP, either technology. If you don't have that thing enshrined in the way you live, there is no way People that have money give it to you. In the old time, when the richest men in the world were merchants, traders, they were the merchants. You go to the Bible, you read they were the man was they were doing trading. You go to the merchant of Venice, look at Marbet, look at uh, sorry, look at Shakespeare's work. See that the barons, the rich guys, were merchants. They were traders. You know what? Even the richest Africans then they were all merchants. They go through the Silk Road, they go through the Kara Sarah Desert, they were merchants from Kanu going to Khartoum, they were merchants. There was one thing that was happening. They had money. Now, oh. if you needed money that time, they were the people you go to. But the problem oh. was, like I showed in my cough, that there is no way they will give you money because they do not see the mechanism for you to protect their money. So they say, I'm not going to give you money. Because this thing you're asking me that you can build, if you build it, your friend can also come and steal that thing. But it was when they now brought the property rights that they now started releasing their money. 
So he said, okay, I'm not gonna keep this money in the pillow because this document you say that government is gonna protect whatever we come up with and make more money. So they now, they signed that thing around this phase and then the world just changed. So that is the power of property rights. You can't really have it until you have it. And that's what the, the, the develop, developing world needs to, needs to know. Yeah. So, so let's so, go so, to- so, so, yeah, Go ahead. Sorry, Prof. Yeah, just one more additional question based on what you said now. So as a Nigerian company now, uh, let's say I have an idea that's, that is new. I mean, it's more of a, a new invention, right? So do you, is, that, is, it, is it advisable to protect that idea in the US, right? Since the US economy or the US legal system would better protect the idea. Anyway. Um, remember that patent is not just going, to, if you are going to sell that product in US, uh, maybe you have a better chance. It's better. So you could have a patent in US, but if you are not selling that product in US, you are not protected. Yeah, that's the reason why Techno does not sell its products in US, because I think there is a, a, a dispute somewhere that some US companies are saying that either some Chinese companies are violating their patents. But because uh, those Chinese smartphone makers are not selling in US, there is really nothing the, the US company can do because that patent gives exclusivity for them to sell in the US, but that does not mean that that patent gives them exclusivity to sell uh, in the whole world. Unless that patent is a global patent. So you can now file a global patent where no one can use and infringe your patent in anywhere in the world. But I also, uh, there's a startup last two weeks, we have to five patents here in US. It's a Nigerian startup. It's actually one of the startups that is coming to our, our syndicate. We like the AI systems they built. They built one of the finest solutions we have seen from, from, from Lagos over a very long time with AI. These are extremely brilliant mathematicians, very brilliant guys. So we say, hey guys, we release money for them to go and protect it in US because the product they are going to launch will be applicable in any part of the world. It's such a very good transformation out there. So, but we don't usually do that because I mean, sometimes what people would think is a big deal, is not a big deal. So if you think your deal is great, that's when you can spend that $25,000 to pursue patent. But otherwise that's not really an issue, maybe. There is no patenting thing to be done in e-commerce. There's no patenting thing to be done in logistics. Some of those things are code. You can pick online and build an app. But there are moments when you think you have something great that you have to protect. Thank you very but, much. Paul. But, but the, the patents and IP I'm talking about in this plot is not really the one on technology. It's the right to capital. Like okay. you have a dispute with your bank. Why should a dispute with your bank take 12 years? Because technically, banks do not run on a piece of paper. You would think that what could happen is that a group of accountants can go in, print all the bank's record over a period of time, and they can reconcile. But it's in Nigeria that you have a, a problem with your bank. The bank is suing you that what you said they have debited you is not. And you are suing the bank you debited you. Yet, it could last for four or five years. But you ask yourself, is this bank not run on a piece of electronic system that somebody can just take time, honestly look at what it? So when you have a system that is built in that way, investors do not have confidence to release that capital. The reason why we are enjoying what we are enjoying that these investors invest, because somebody figured out another way of overcoming that property rise through the redomicilization of these companies in US so that they can inject that capital to now come and work in Africa. If you remove that, the money will dry up because they will not. Yeah. Mm. Okay, um, just yeah. take two more questions that we'll call it today. Uh, so let's go to uh, uh, Chibik Isaac, please. Chibik Isaac. Mm. Are you still there, Chibik? Mm. Okay, if it's not there, um, Adetola, please go ahead and ask your question. We'll just take two more, then we'll, we'll, we'll round up. Thanks. Can you hear me? I'm yes, yeah, yes, go ahead. Yes, we can hear you. Mm. Okay, I think you've answered my question. What I wanted to ask is that if a company that is incorporated in Nigeria wants to seek for foreign investment and 
um, but they're not so okay. They're going to open it. Uh, they're going to incorporate it in the U.S. Which of the branch becomes the headquarter and why? I think you've answered the question what I was trying to ask. Yes, yes. So, the headquarters is the U.S. one. So let's go right. to uh, Ogunta. The question I want to ask just a very quick one, please. What does it mean that a twenty percent carry? What does it mean? Okay, okay. Twenty percent carry basically means if you let's assume that you invest uh, ten thousand dollars. And, and you invested at that company when um, the valuation invested ten thousand dollars. Then, at the end of the day, uh, the company is sold that your own portion is hundred thousand dollars. The way we calculate is that first of all, you take your ten thousand dollars, meaning that ninety thousand remains. Tequila will own twenty percent of that ninety thousand, which means you wow. keep eighty percent of that ninety thousand. So, so. It's hundred thousand that comes to you. You take out your ten thousand, and it remains ninety thousand. Our twenty percent carry is twenty percent of that ninety thousand. That's what we call carry. That's how they do it in investment bank. Okay, so is it the same the same percentage on amount invested? No, no, not the amount invested. It's on twenty percent of the profit made after your okay. principal investment amount has been taken out. Okay, thank you. Mm. So let's say you invest ten thousand. Your the total amount allocated to you after the company is sold, let's say in pay stack, is let's say hundred thousand. We take out that ten thousand. That means it's ninety thousand in so profit in quote. We take twenty percent of that. Ninety. Why you keep eighty percent of that? All right. Thank you. All right. Cheers. That that is actually the money we make, and that's incentive for us to go and make sure that we deliver great value. Okay, so um, I think uh, with Destiny, we've already answered your question. And I know there are so many questions in the chat, uh, but just because I don't want us to spend too much time here. Uh, um, okay, go ahead. Uh, okay, great. Uh, that explains why can't we not remove those frictions and scale? Our opportunities, yes. Um, uh, 20% I just explained now is a carry. Mm, yes, Nam, they explained it again. Okay, okay, so we explained that. Or Messi will explain that already. So, gentlemen and ladies, and also entrepreneurs, uh, this is our contact at it's also there, um, and capital at Pass Michael. Uh, I can just show you, through, but we have everything in a page. Uh, if you come here, um, you just see a page where because we, we like to keep it uh, very simple and Last year, we were honored as the, as the best VC in Nigeria. If you just go to school at the Kida and Kida Capital, you can just search it online at uh, this award. So our process is simple. You can just read it up here. We are hoping that we will work with you all as we move into this one that starts in the next uh, week. So thank you so much. And if you're looking for startups that we've invested in, I think uh, we have a couple of them here. Mm -hmm. uh, I think, think I posted. So this was one of our deals. Uh, we have Pass, Mako, Vertifly, Trade Grid, Lafia, Telehealth. We we'll always do a typical of, of the millions of dollars anytime we do this because we have so many rich people in the system. So thank you. And uh, please share with us, with your friends. We want everyone to invest with Tequila Capital. Have a wonderful afternoon and evening. Thank you so much. And thanks for it. Uh, thank you, Prof. Um, thank, you, bro. thank you, Thank you. Thank you very bro. much. Yeah, bye. Thank you, Pearl. Bye. Thank you. 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 Bro. Thank you. Thank you, bro.